Merry Christmas. It's my pleasure to join you in your homes on Christmas Day as we have the opportunity to gather and worship here online together. And so I just want to point out that I've got the lantern here that we used in the worship service last night. The light that has come from uh, people passing it from place to place and person to person all the way tracing back to the Bethlehem Grotto where Jesus was born and it's called the Peace Candle. So I wanted to have it here with us this morning as an opportunity to remind you that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And so let's go ahead and begin our time of worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, we thank you for coming into this world and being with us. You stepped in to our lives and we are so thankful for what you have done and what you continue to do daily in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me as we say together our Christmas Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, announced by the angels, worshipped by the shepherds, adored by the wise men, who lived to suffer, die, and rise again, to free me from the power of sin, death, and the devil. I believe in the Holy Spirit, by whose work Christ is born within my heart, who nurtures my faith, moving me to live in obedience, trust, and surrender, who empowers me to live as the child of God I was intended to be, both now, in this time, and forevermore. Amen. On this Christmas Day, we need to acknowledge that when we look back into Scripture, God had been quiet for many, many years, over 400 to be a little closer to giving you an idea. No prophets, no one to come to speak the word of the Lord. So when we look today at Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 38, and I encourage you to go read to remember the piece of the story, an angel of the Lord in God's time has been sent to speak to a man named Zechariah to have a message for him and for his wife, Elizabeth. What's that message? God has heard your prayers. Wow, that's a good news for us, that God hears our prayers. And so the prayers were for a child and they're gonna have a child and they're to name that child John. Now being human and encountering an angel, it's a little scary, it's a little intimidating. Zachariah asks a question that how can he trust the angel in this message? And the angel says, because you've doubted, you will not be able to speak until all this has come to pass. And so as he exits the temple and his friends, his coworkers finds that he no longer can speak, 
they know something has happened that is of God while he was serving the Lord there in the temple area. Then our story picks up with a young girl. You guessed it, Mary. We go to Mary and that same angel, Gabriel, appears to her. Sometime later, after he had appeared to Elizabeth and to Zechariah, or actually just Zechariah, and tells her that there's good news of great joy. These things are going to unfold before you that will really change the course of humanity. That the Son of God is going to be born and that she is going to be the mother of Jesus. She asked a question as well. How can this be since I'm betrothed, but I have not been with any man? The angel said, this will be from God and he will take care of all of that. And that nothing is impossible with God. Imagine hearing that. And Mary's response, when you go read it, I just want to encourage you to soak in those last words there in verse 38, where she just speaks out of faith and let us enjoy a little music now that ties in with this. Our next scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Here we find the story of Joseph. Joseph has a vision. The angel doesn't appear to him, but he has a vision because he's thinking now that he has found out that Mary is expecting a child and it's not his child and they're betrothed, that he wants to put her away in a quiet sense. He doesn't want to embarrass her. He doesn't want to expose her to public ridicule, but also he doesn't feel right to marry her. And so God steps in. In his time, he intervenes and he sends Joseph a message that is what is happening with Mary and him as the stepfather basically to be of Jesus, that it's all from God and it's part of his plan. Joseph's response 
is one that is important for us to look at. And I encourage you to go back and read that. But the angel helps him understand that this is spoken by the prophet with these words. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph woke from sleep, and he took Mary to be his wife. next piece of our Christmas story comes to us from Luke 1, verses 39 through 56. I couldn't remember the text. But in this piece, we see that Mary travels to see her cousin, her cousin Elizabeth. That's Zachariah and Elizabeth. That's John the Baptist's parents. And Elizabeth is still expecting at this point. She's about six months pregnant. And as Mary and Elizabeth come together and they meet, they're so excited, they greet each other, there's great joy, but also such a wonderful moment when we see in reading the text that Elizabeth acknowledges that even the baby in her womb leapt for joy in hearing the voice of the mother of the Lord. Wow. What an incredible thing. Again, how God comes in to our lives. And so Mary, out of her great joy, her soul just magnifies the Lord. And she sings, actually she speaks, an incredible song for us. But we're going to hear a piece of music that captures her words that she spoke.
The next piece of our Christmas narrative comes from Luke 1, 57 through 66. I encourage you again to go read that. In this section of scripture, what we have is a beautiful story of the birth of John the Baptist. Long awaited child, in their old age, finally the child comes to fruition and is born. Can you imagine their excitement and their joy in holding that child? On the eighth day, as was the custom, they take the child to the temple to have John circumcised and to officially be named. When you named a child, you usually named it after the father, a boy child at least, or maybe one of the other family members, but it was usually a family name. So to great surprise, they name the child John. Now remember, Zechariah can't speak at this time, so it's Elizabeth that speaks. So people that are gathered around going, there's no John in your family line. This can't be right, and they question her. At this point, not able to speak, Zechariah asks for a writing tablet, and he writes, his name is John, affirming that. Upon writing that, all of a sudden his speech returns, he's able to talk, and he praises God. He praises God for all the things that God has done, looking at a spoken kind of, almost like a history of wonderful moments where God from the Old Testament had interacted in people's lives and has blessed them now with this child an answer to their longtime prayers. And so please have the opportunity to take and read Zechariah's proclamation of how great the Lord is. The next piece of our Christmas story comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We all know this, it's read every Christmas. The piece where we hear Caesar Augustus has declared that a accounting of the people, a census, must be taken and everyone must return to their home, their family home. This sets in motion fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And so Mary and Joseph begin their journey to the city of David, to Bethlehem. And as they travel and get closer and closer and finally arrive, it is time for the baby Jesus to finally arrive. And she gives birth. She wraps Jesus in swaddling cloth and lies him in a manger. What a beautiful picture that is for us as we come close to the manger, and as God has come so close to us. And we enjoy some music that reminds us and captures this moment.
As our Christmas story continues, we stay in Luke chapter 2 and we look at verses 8 through 14 where we have the announcement to the shepherds. They're out tending their flocks. An angel of the Lord appears and has a wonderful message for them, a message that is for them an incredible peace because they were the lowest of the low and they were not entrusted with any kind of message. But this night, things changed for them. They received that wonderful message and that they were to give glory to God in the highest for a Savior was born. And they were to go and find that Savior wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And so they got up and they traveled to Bethlehem where they found the things just as the angel had proclaimed. As we see the text unfold, we see that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. And as the shepherds left, they were so blessed and they returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen, all that was spoken to them, and all that was heard. And we enjoy some music of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So our next piece of our narrative for Christmas takes us out of the Gospel of Luke and into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, where we meet the Magi, or the wise men. Now we know the story, but sometimes we get things a little confused. The Magi were traveling, and they were looking for the King of the Jews. And so by this time, Jesus is not a baby lying in the manger on the night that he was born, but it was sometime later. Scripture refers to Jesus as a child and Mary and Joseph are now in a house. They're not in the stable or the house part of the inn. They are out on their own. They have their own digs, so to speak, their own house. And so as they are staying there, they are waiting for just life to continue on, but the wise men show up. They don't show up there, but they show up at the palace of King Herod. King Herod is not a good king. He wants power and he wants to maintain his power. And so he deals in a very stealthy way with the wise men. But he does call out the priests and the scribes so they could speak from the Old Testament if there was some prophecy that would help the wise men find the child, the king of the Jews that they were seeking for. And yes, there's prophecy speaking that the child would be born in Bethlehem. And so King Herod says, go find the child and then let me know where that child is that I might come to and worship him, having no intention to worship him. The wise men set off and they found the child and then we have the beautiful scene that we so well know and is part of our tradition of the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, the gifts. We don't know how many wise men were there, but they showed up and those gifts were given and they worshiped the newborn king. Having a dream, they left, not telling Herod where they were going or that they had found the Christ child, but returning to their home 
and a separate route. And so we hear another wonderful song of What Child Is This? Our last reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 2, a continuation of the verses that were read about the story of the wise men. Verses 13 through 15, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. He tells him, you need to leave. You need to take Mary and you need to take Jesus and leave. Depart, go to Egypt, and in due time I will call you back out of Egypt, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. And so he is obedient to the Lord. They rise, they pack their things, and they move to Egypt until it is time for them to receive a message that it is safe to return after Herod's death. So on this Christmas day, we looked at the total story from beginning to end, taking Matthew and Luke together to see what God did. So my question is, what did you see? We heard from angels, that was cool. We heard how God had not spoken for over 400 years and all of a sudden, he's everywhere. Not that he wasn't before, but we really begin to see him open up and lay out his plan for salvation. We see God moving in next door to us to become our neighbor. We have the opportunity to see and hear about wise men, right? You have the opportunity to, you know, just hear prayers for a child being, and see those prayers answered. There, there's so many things there. And we see how God takes just regular, normal, everyday people, just like us. We have blue collar and white collar people. We have people who were staying in a, in a stable, in a manger where the child was born. And we have 
a king in a palace. We, we have wise men who are considered the, the smart ones of society and shepherds who are considered the outsiders, the outcasts, right? We have all these different people and characters that are laid out for us in Scripture. We, we have a, a carpenter and his young bride, and we have an old priest and his beyond childbearing years wife. All these contrasts kind of point to the fact that what? Maybe God uses everybody, regardless of age or background. We did have lots of Jewish people, but we also had the wise men who were from another country. It didn't matter. God used them all. Even used King Herod. Here you had these people who were wise and seeking the Jewish king and had good intentions, and you had Herod who had horrible intentions. And yet God used them all. So the question for me today is, I was thinking about all these texts put together, and God's Word is so rich and full, and we can always get into it, and we can just continue to mine it and learn things from it and see how God works, but wh where are you at? Are you here in Lakeland? Are you in Polk County? Are you in Florida? Are you, are you in Alaska or Minnesota or New York? Or are you on your way to Grandma's house? Are you in your car? Are you sitting at home in front of your TV? Are you at a, a friend's house or family's house and, and watching this? Are you watching it alone in your room or with company? Where are you? Uh, maybe we need to look at that a little differently, just not physically where are you, but where are you? And I'm not asking the same question. Where are you right now? Are you one who is seeking God? Are you one that maybe has written off God? Or one that you feel you've found God, but you don't understand God? Or, or, or a person who is just sitting there going, I am content and happy in my relationship with my Lord and Savior. Where are you? That's maybe a good question to ask ourselves on this Christmas day. You see, the reality is we can't run from God. We can't hide from God. We can't simply just ignore God because God, as we saw in all of those stories that we laid out, those readings from Christmas, used all kinds of people, including some who did not believe so where are you? The reality is God is using you. Because each one of those people that we talked about, that you heard about in the stories that were read from Matthew and Luke, they each had their own story, but they were also all part of God's story. And so are you. You are part of God's story. God has created you in this time and this place for a reason. You're here not by chance, not by accident. God has sought you out and he's bringing you into his story. Yes, you have your own story, but he is bringing you into his story. Isn't it great to know that God hears our prayers? like he heard the prayers of Elizabeth and Zechariah, as he probably heard the indecision in Joseph's mind of should he take this Mary to be his wife? The anxiety, the fear that both Zechariah and Mary felt when they had the encounter with the angel, they, it's not stated that they were, you know, afraid, afraid, but the angel picked up on it and said, do not be afraid. God knows us. We may not know God, or we may be seeking God, or we may not understand God, but the important thing is that God knows us. He knows us by name, and we are part of his story. 
You know, here, here's what I hope. This Christmas day, as you are watching this, wherever you are at, that you take a little time and find in the midst of the busyness of the day and of life, just a little peace, like the candle represents, like you heard if you listened to last night's Christmas Eve worship about the dreams of Christmas Eve, those lasting dreams. Those are gifts from God as we draw close and take a little look inside the manger. We realize that, you know what? God is the one who has sought us out, who has called us. And that, knowing He hears our prayers, that He cares about us, He knows what we're feeling, all those things that the different people in the Christmas story have shown us don't just apply to those people who lived long ago, but they apply to you and to me now. You see, God came and lived among us. And His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. Those wonderful words, God with us. He's the one who took the action first. He has sought us out and he has connected himself to us, his beloved creation. And he desires to have that relationship with you. And in this new year, as we move through Christmas and look into 2021, God's already there. And he is calling you to be a part of his story. So may you find God's peace in Jesus this Christmas in knowing that you are loved and that he has sought you out and he's made you a part of his story. Let's pray. Lord, this Christmas day, we thank you for your love, for seeking us out, for coming and being our neighbor. You set up next to us through your son, Jesus. You lived among us. You know what we feel. You know how we hurt. You know how we celebrate good things in life and the sorrows in life. And those things you work through. It's all part of your story. And we are a part of that story. And so we thank and we praise you as we continue to walk day by day by faith, not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you and keep you. His face shines upon you and is gracious to you. He looks upon you with his favor and he grants you his peace. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone.